Hey, family. Thank you for tuning into Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please hit that subscribe button. Be sure to like and comment on this video. Today's episode is Ifa and Hoodoo. And today we're bringing back one of our most interesting guests, Mr. Rafiq Pringle. Rafiq, thank you for coming back. Oh, no problem. No problem. It's, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. It's a blessing. I love it when you're here because my wife lets me drink and smoke on the podcast. <laughs> so I think we're going to have you as a recurring guest for all of my bad habits. I'm cool with that. Don't threaten me with a good Don't time. Don't threaten me with a good time. That is my saying. Do not <laughs> threaten me with a good time. I will come here just to be like, yeah, we're going to do a podcast on being on a podcast. <laughs> Just so we can drink. Phil's a professional in that. We're doing podcasts on how to do a podcast, you know. <laughs> um, Ifa and Hoodoo, brother. I, I tell you, when I first opened the Botanica, I came from a background of Ifa and Santeria. And we're pretty hermetic people. You know, Ifa by nature is very reserved, very, you know, closed off. You being an initiate, you you understand this. Mm -hmm. Um but I tell you, when I opened the Botanica, I was so excited because it forced me to delve into all these different spiritual systems. Because, you know, the Ifa and Santeria community, we're, 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 we're very orthodox in that regard. Like, we don't do nothing else. Either you're a Baalau, you're a Santero, you're a Palero, you're an Espiritista. But when I started learning about crystals, candle work, and a more, you know, eclectic sense, and then I kept hearing this word hoodoo, hoodoo, hoodoo. I had heard of voodoo, being from Miami. But I wasn't really familiar with um, with the concept of hoodoo, right? So um, we sell this book. It's a, it's a very popular book on hoodoo. I, I saw people coming in, and, and they were gravitating towards that. And then I, I noticed them near the herb wall, the roots, et cetera. So I said there, there might be something here. So, you know, just to kick it off and, and kind of give our viewers who are like me that didn't understand what it was, you know, what is hoodoo? I can tell you what it's not first off. Okay. What it's not is hexing. Random, you know, oh, this person doesn't like me, I'm going to hex. Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. What hoodoo is, it is a tradition of spiritual practices that was created by the slaves, hidden in Christianity for the protection of family and self. That's what hoodoo is. I love that definition because I, I think it gives it the respect that it deserves because I've noticed you see so many things on TikTok and, you know, through all these other social mediums. It, it's it's being, I mean, now knowing what it is, being around people such as yourself, a bunch of the great practitioners that come into the Botanica, um, you realize what it is, how it's a legitimate spiritual system. But if someone was to look on social media and see how, you know, everything's being tagged a certain way, yes, they're going to get the wrong impression, you know. Um, so... I, I guess, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about the history because what you just stated sounds very similar to what practitioners of Santeria did. You know, we had the slaves come over. They came to Cuba. They were being oppressed and missioned upon to, you know, worship different icons and idols that they weren't familiar with. And they were able to hide their uh, their beliefs behind, you know, the guise of Catholic saints. So, you know, how does hoodoo really, where, where does it, where was it most like, where, what area was it most prevalent? Well, it was prevalent in the Gullah Geechee areas. Um, I am a product of the, of that area being uh, raised uh, and having my family born in Wilmington, North Carolina. This is an area that stretches from Jacksonville all the way up the coast to parts of Virginia um, that they are now finding that Gullah Geechee people were born in. Um, these people come through the diaspora from lands as, you know, the uh, Yoruba land, um, the Congo, you know, uh, Benin. So they came there and they were stripped. So they created this system, this tradition of, of what they knew, of what they tried to protect themselves. And that area from Jacksonville up the coast is prevalent. Um, it goes inwards, uh, of course. You know, there's uh, subsects in Georgia, um, Alabama, Mississippi, New Orleans. So it's all it's prevalent in the South because, of course, that's where you saw a lot of can. slavery. Yeah. You know, people went to the North to be freed. That's when you see that great migration up top and then back down to, to find themselves once again. 
Um, could you define Gullah Geechee? You know, Gullah Geechee is a people. Um, Gullah Geechee, um, it's it's uh, it's almost kind of without getting the uh, the Wikipedia version of it, which is totally wrong. But it's the people who they have that certain twang to their voice. Those are the people that when they talk, they talk like these. Okay. You know, so you have to know where you're from and that area to know these are the Gullah Geechee people and this is what they do. So Gullah Geechee is the lifestyle. It's it's not only just a dialect, it's not only just people, it's also a lifestyle. You know, these people um, were not only uh, tobacco, cotton, indigo, but they were also fishermen. They were also uh, shellfish uh, cultivators. Um, a lot of plantations back then weren't just cotton. They were shellfish. They were fishers. They were, you know, it they, they, it, it was the uh, tobacco fields. So that's where these people come from. Well, I'm so happy we're doing them justice with the leaf, you know, and, 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 and you see this, the tobacco is, is such a, you know, a, a medium point to be able to call on these energies, whether it's with any fa, balo, or even with uh, the Gullah Geechee people, it's beautiful to be given them that honor, especially when they went through so much pain to be able to cultivate it and then not even get the credit, I would imagine, for, for you know all of those skills that they brought from Africa because there are studies coming out now that show that tobacco in, in its original form or various forms was in Africa even before you know people are trying to say that the New World brought it over there. Yeah. You know, These people had all these things, and there's even verses of Ifan. I can't wait to do the Ifan cigar episode, and, and you will be invited. Oh, thank you. you know. Thank you kindly. <laughs> but you know, when I first heard this word, the, the Gullah Geechee, it was a couple different times. I remember I was listening to a Rick Ross song, mm -hmm. and I, I guess he has some descendancy um, within that you know group and then apart from that, I actually had a, uh, I actually took AP history, you know, when I was yeah. in high school, you know what I'm saying? I, I did well in some subjects and history was always one that fascinated me. My teacher was actually from this area. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time there was a young lady from South Carolina in the class. I believe he was from North Carolina. And, um, you know, he was a very suave guy, you know, and he actually spoke with a little bit of, you know, the twang or flavor that you mentioned. He was wearing white linen suits, and like I was like, this dude's on a whole nother level. Shout out to North Carolina. That's how we do. Yeah, shout out, <laughs> shout out to NC. Shout out to the Carolinas. That's how we do. Man. That's how we do in the Carolinas. Beautiful people. You know what I'm saying? But it was just, he was he was fresh, and he'd go to church, and you know he'd talk about people catching the spirit, and you know me seeing what I saw at home, and then hearing those parallels, I'm like, oh my god, you know this is it's it's out there, not only in the form of Ifa, but in other expressions. But I, I remember him kind of you know speaking to the lady from. Uh, south carolina and being like oh those are the geechies mm -hmm. you know and, I, and I, what, i'm not gonna say he said it in a derogatory term but you know do some people frown upon this yes yes and growing up you, you never wanted to be called gullah or geechee i noticed that because the way he said it i was like i don't yeah, know if it, i'd like to be called that that way yeah it was always you know to where now we've started you know to embrace it nice. it started to become our thing now to where you know when i was growing up it wasn't cool to be from the country. It wasn't cool to be from the backwoods. Now everybody wants to be from the backwoods now. You know, it it, it wasn't cool then, but now it is. And now, you know, the, the Gullah name, the Geechee names are starting to be more prevalent, are starting to be more uh, acceptable in, in society. There, you're, you're starting to see more influences in modern, modern pop culture, um, songs, rap music, you're starting to see it now. So now it's become cool. It's become the thing now. I love that because even Ifa's going through that renaissance period and people are trying to delve back into their roots, which is kind of where we got the name for this whole show. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's so beautiful because what we were oppressed for, we're now being prideful over. I think us as minorities, us as you know, children of Africa, the way we've been able to turn that oppression into triumph, I think is probably one of the greatest feats within humanity, you know? Um, I, I tell you, is that where the secret aspect comes from? Because if, if being Gullah Geechee was frowned upon, obviously, because I would imagine these people had a lot of influence in the revolts and, you know, the empowerment of, you know, African, you know, transcultured people into this country, you know, they were probably a threat as mm -hmm. well. So is that where the secrecy came from? Yes. And were they the ones really powering all of those revolts and things like that? You know, if you look at the Charleston slave, you know what I'm saying, revolts, um, by Gullah Jack, Denmark, Denmark Vassy. You know, these were the people who 
basically set the slave codes to where blacks can't read. We don't want black people to read. We don't want black people. We don't want slaves to be organized. We don't want them in large groups with one person unless, unless they were preaching Christianity, which Nat Turner oh, wow. decided I'm going to start hiding things in the Bible for my people because a lot of things had to be done in secret. Wow. A lot of things had to be done in code. Um, a lot of the songs, um, if you listen to them, um, I've listened to quite a few of them, and I'm like, wow. If you don't know, you don't know. But if you know, they were giving details on slate how on how to escape the plantation. Wow. You know, songs like Run Mary Run. The run. spiritual songs. Yes. Right? I mean, they were they were hiding things they in were plain hiding sight. Things up and up even with hair braiding. You know, they would literally take a person's hair and braid it and it would be a map, a road map on how to escape. That's incredible. You know, people always carried seeds on them so that way when they escaped, they could get somewhere, hide out for a month or two and plant something to eat. So it's 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 become that now. I think that's beautiful because once again, being able to triumph and them bringing all of those skills over from Africa. You know, when you look at the uh, the, the travel of Ifa from Nigeria to the Caribbean and ultimately the world, they would actually hide the cowrie shells in the hair. You know, people were looking, you know, now it's a fashion statement, but then it was actually survival. Like, oh, that's just a hairstyle. No, they were actually bringing their divination method over, you know. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about Gullah Jack. The, re the reason being is because the other day I'm on Facebook and I, I saved the article. Um, it was talking about some of the most influential members within this tradition. And, and the first guy you read about is Gullah Jack. So is there any inf more information on him? Uh uh, besides what's on the uh, net, um, Gullah Jack uh, was from Charleston, South Carolina, or the outskirts of it. Um, he led the slave revolts uh, in Charleston. Um, this was done with the help of Denmark Vassy um, to where he was captured. Uh, he actually, during his trial, was doing hand signals in hoodoo and causing people that told on him to seize causing people that told him to forget what they were saying to where the judge had to have his hands bound because he was that much of a threat to where he just, his presence intimidated people. That's awesome. Yeah, he was <laughs> that's, a leader. Yeah. That's, that's, that's beautiful to me to where, you know, things like that to where, you know, you know, Gullah Jack was one of the, um, I, I can't say forefathers or founders, but he was one of the influential people that said, it's okay to fight back. You have to fight back because we come from a people who never laid down for anybody. So Gullah Jack is very important. Yeah, may he rest, man. A messiah to his people, you know. Is that where things like shrimp and grits come from? Because you mentioned, I'm a huge fan of this. I have to stay <laughs> away from it because I'm trying to diet. But I mean, like, this is, that's one of my favorite, if not my favorite breakfast. Mm -hmm. Is because you mentioned the shellfish and... You know, your god brother Eric was actually talking to me about this the other day and, you know, just seeing how how influential these people were. Is that where things like that come from? Shrimp and grits, fish heads and grits, catfish and grits. Anything that has the word grits in it. <laughs> that was actually my nickname in high school. <laughs> Believe it or not, they used to call me grits. Like, so, good Lord. Grits, grits were very important because it was, con it, was, it was what you gave the poor people. It yeah. was, it's what you fed the slaves, you know, so... You know, when we were given scraps, we had to make do of it. So, yeah, we had to, you know, eat the fish heads with the with the grits. We had to eat the shrimp with the grits because shrimp back then wasn't considered anything. It was considered like, yeah. you know, lobster. Yeah. They, when they used to take people to Australia, like to be thrown into the outback, they, they would say this is inhumane how you feed us lobster. You know, yeah. look, at, look at lobster now. Yeah, you know? So it, it was it was the scraps. And that's where it came from. Shrimp and grits is my favorite thing now. Oh man, well, <laughs> I love so, shrimp and grits. I remember grits. the first time I had that, I was like, "This is this is unholy." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's so good, you know. But um, yeah. And once again, you know, tribulation, the triumph. Um, what was your first interaction like? I mean, when I was getting into Ifa and I saw people in the community doing things that were not ordinary, or seeing like my aunts do certain things that were a little suspicious. What was like that first interaction where you're like, okay, you know, some of my family members or people in the community are doing something else? 
my great grandmother. Wow, you met her? Yes. Oh my God. My great grandmother. I remember my great grandmother. One day, is this is actually is is one of the two things that I that stick out in my brain about getting into where I am right now. Three things actually. My great grandmother. One day, we had uh, come down from Philadelphia, and I was awakened by just a lot of banging. I'm m- maybe seven, eight years old. I'm a kid. And I kind of peeked out the room and I saw my great grandmother standing on broken glass. Oh, wow. And people were around her. And she was, and she was speaking to him. And I'm like, what is this? Well, as a kid, I don't know. So I I go back to bed. Yeah, sure. (laughs) And, you know, I, I would tell my mom that story, like, what what is that? And my mom would be like, I, I can't tell you. There's a lot yeah. of things I can't tell you. So it was things like that that I saw. Um, I remember being at my grandmother's house, and my grandmother had a room. And I was maybe seven, eight years old still. I, I'm, I think this was the same summer. And I remember in this room, she, we, we the, I was – one of the children that was not allowed to go into this room. Well, I get up early one day, everybody else asleep. You know, the inquisitive me decides I'm going to see what's in this room. And I open this door and there's jars everywhere with things. I don't even know what they were to this day, but I saw roots. I saw herbs. I saw, you know, things that were pickled. I saw all these things and it was this table. And on this table had newspaper. I'm like, who puts newspaper on the table? Yeah. And on that newspaper table was a glass of water. Oh wow. And I'm like, why? Why is this? What? What? What am I seeing? And you know, as a kid, you know, you don't know. So I closed the door. Kept it moving. And just kept it moving. So those <laughs> were the things that I saw to where I'm like, hmm, yeah. Family's on something different right now. Yeah, and we don't talk about it. And, yeah. and that's really a parallel to me because you start seeing these things or even within on this side of the curtain because some people wouldn't even know their family members were involved in anything like this until they passed away. And people mm-hmm. started coming out of the woodwork be like, yo, your grandfather, yo, your grandmother be like, I lived with her my whole life. I didn't know she was doing all of mm-hmm. that. You know what I'm saying? And that goes back to the secrecy and being able to protect, you know, and preserve um, were you brought up in the church? I mean, apart from all the things that were yes. going on? Yes, we were we were we were brought up in the church, but looking back, we almost we almost changed churches every couple of years. You know, and it was one of those things to where I didn't find out till later that people in my community were fearful of my family. Oh. Because, oh, you know, they 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 do the devil's work. That was the thing. They do the, that family does the devil's work. Oh wow. So, you know, every couple of years to where um up until high school, we stopped uh, up until I got into high school, I stopped going. You know, it was hard when my great grandmother passed away to where we couldn't get a a a minister mm-hmm. because they were so fearful wow. of the family. And these were things that I had to realize like 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 hindsight's always twenty twenty uh, is always twenty twenty. Like looking back, oh, that's why they were scared. That's why. The so. ironic part about it is, a lot of those people. Like I mean, I consult people from every walk of life, and you know, the most important thing for me is protecting my clients, right? But you have people that you know go to church, you know, Sunday morning, and then Monday morning they're here at the Botanica, right? And we mm-hmm. protect them. But you begin to realize people need answers. People, yes. people, people need results. And it, there's nothing more traumatic than taking a people that had a culture, that had a way of life, and everything was peaceful and prosperous, and then you literally strip it away and then impose something else on them. And I, I hear this all the time. Joseph, I feel out of place at church. I feel like I'm being called to something else. Uh, it feels unnatural. You know, as you've grown into an initiated to be fond, being, you know, uh, an inheritor of this beautiful culture, you know, did you st- at what point did you start feeling that call? Like, I need to delve into who I am and where I'm from more. Uh, well, one instance was I got embarrassed in church. Oh, no. I, I was in church. Um, 
any any of, of my country folks know it was one of them Sundays where the spirit was moving and I wanted to just be a part of it. I didn't want to say anything. Yeah. I just wanted to have that energy around me. And I remember the pastor stopping everything oh, wow. and pointing at me and saying, you're not singing, you're not dancing, you're not shouting. And I remember looking around going, I know he ain't talking about me. <laughs> so after church, I, I kind of went up to him. And in typical African-American churches, he wouldn't talk to me. Or he sent it. When I walked up to him, he had one of his minions, deacons, <clears throat> intercept me. and was like, yeah, you got the devil in you. We, we know about your family and all this other stuff. And I'm like, you know oh, what? Lord. If that's the case, I need to start looking into why. And I want to say I was in college by that time. So, you know, when you, when you go to college, that's the big exploration. You're, You're finding, free. yeah, you want to so find people, out you know? things. Yeah. You want to do things. And I started looking into it and I started asking my mom questions to where my mom now felt comfortable telling me things. And my mom used to say, hey, you remember those times I, I used to send you to the store to get you know, a fifth of brandy and a pack of a uh, pack of more menthol light 100s. And then I come back and then there's people that on, people sitting on the front porch. She was doing work. Wow. You know, yeah, man, your grandmother was one of the biggest bootleggers in eastern North Carolina. Yo, shout out to grandma. <laughs> yo. Yeah, take a sip for her. Man. So, shout out to grandma. You know, and she protected herself and she protected her clientele by having them have crab legs with them. You know, that was the form of protection that Gullah Jack used. And there, these were things that I would see, like, every time we go to Grandma's house, why the hell are these crab legs? And she had a booming crab leg <laughs> yeah. business. Yeah, like, why are these crab legs just laying around in the backyard? Yeah. You know, it was things like that to where, you know, I would see these things and not knowing. And then once my mom felt comfortable telling me these things, I was like, oh. Starts making sense. Now it starts making sense. But then, you know, as in college, you don't want to be that weird guy. Yeah, of course not. You know, so I kind of put everything on the back burner until I had, you know, some some horrible things happen to me. And I started, you know, hearing how my grandmother was lighting candles for me. And I'm like, why is she lighting candles? Well, your grandma's lighting candles. Oh, why why is the lady at the house that always has her head wrapped? Why why is she there? Well, that was the other person. Yeah. So. And, you know, I'm sorry that that happened to you. You know, to be publicly chastised in any, you know, function or medium is, you know, it's inhumane. Yeah. But, you know, what I see there is a lot of frustration because, you know, you look at somebody like you that, that comes from a lineage that, you know, maintain their identity in the face of oppression. You know, someone that's in the position of pastor, you know, someone who essentially, you know, lost the idea that Nat, Nat Turner had, basically what you're saying, where he actually got consumed by said system, you know, it, it screams of frustration to me because mm -hmm. why would you chastise this brother in front of everybody? Why would you chastise him for being different, you know? And it, it makes you wonder how deep that oppression is where we've literally been turned against ourselves, yeah. you know, break down another brother. It doesn't, it doesn't build me up, you know? Um, I, I remember learning about hoodoo, um, you know, briefly and, and interacting and realizing very quickly who do any fire or family? Yeah. Because when you when you realize the big thing about the herbs and the roots and, you know, the, the, the animals and, you know, just looking at the culture of people, um, I quickly realized the, these people are family. And you, you begin to realize why they get so many results because you're literally using the same thing Orumila used. Orumila mm -hmm. worked with roots. He worked with herbs. You know, it's this Africa is all about the ancestor and nature worship. That's all mm -hmm. we had, you know, yeah. the earth and the people that came before us, you know, so it, 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 it was very comforting to see that, you know, a system, even though it's being misinterpreted, you know, socially was, was family to us, you know, and that, that's why when people come in here and they're hoodoo practitioners, you know, they're received with open arms because it's a very seamless interaction, you know, it's just a different, you know, expression. You used a, uh, a term, recently in, in, in the other interview on Ogun. We can throw hands. Or we can throw roots. Or we can throw roots. What does that mean? <laughs> Without incriminating myself, uh, <laughs> it, it means that, hey, 
However you want to take it there, we can take it there. You know, I got I got no problem barring divination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I notice when you disappear a little bit or because you don't want Odumi to say yeah. nothing to you. You come you come in with that with that squint. I'm like, oh Lord. Uh, uh, barring divination, I got no problem going either way. And my family raised me like that. You know, one of the I I was told by a older hoodoo practitioner in Tarboro, uh, North Carolina. Uh, shout out to Mr. Lomax. I know you ain't watching this because you don't even mess with the internet. But um, <laughs> shout out. He was he was always saying, man, you always have to be dual headed. No 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 matter what you do, every offense has a defense. So you can either throw hands with a person or you could throw roots at them. He said, either way, you're going to get some type of change. You're going to get some type of result. And you have to be prepared for it. So that I've always lived by that motto. However you want to do this, we can do this. You know, people people want to come with the whole, oh, well, you know, you know, um, it's the devil work. It's this, it's that. Hey, we can throw hands, we can throw roots. However you want to do this. How intense does root war get? Try staying awake for three days. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, try, you know, there's 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 certain, you know what I'm saying, workings that you have to be up for three days, seven days, or nine days because you have to make because that's the requirement of it. And that's the sacrifice that you're making to see whatever change that you want to come through. So it gets intense. That's it gets an, very intense. That's a really interesting concept because Ifa has a similar one. There, there's an Odu or a sign known as Ejilashe Bora that says when there's war, the soldier does not sleep. So because they have the concept in Yoruba land that when you're sleeping, your soul is exposed. You know, it's it, it the body needs rest, but the soul does not. So it's kind of floating over you. But at that point, it has no way of protecting itself, you know. Mm -hmm. So you'd see in Cuba, you'd see when people were going to war spiritually, they would sleep during the day and then be up at night. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Because that's unnatural. So it was. It, it would get very intense, you know, the same way. So it's an interesting, and and you begin to realize these people are Yoruba, these people are African, because you look at concepts like that, especially with them being so detached from the motherland, mm -hmm. and still being able to preserve even those concepts. It's nothing short of of of, of a victory because they were literally displaced, yes. you know. So you know, what were your first steps in hoodoo? You know, now that you've gone through college. Now that you've gotten this confirmation of who you are from, you know, your elders, what were those first steps when you started getting more involved and experimenting with it? The first steps I had to do was letting go, letting go of, of, of not per se Christianity, but the mind game that it played with you. That was hard. You know, that shadow period of having everything fall apart. You have to go through that. You have to go to where you're totally broken down mentally, physically, emotionally, to where you don't even want to be around people, you know, to where the crying and the, the nervous breakdowns are almost commonplace. And there's no time period on how long it'll last. That was the scary part. That was my first steps into saying, into saying, okay, I'm going to make a change from this point. As soon as I decided to make that change, everything that I thought was for me wasn't. Everything stopped. People walked away that I thought weren't. Things that I had, I lost. So it's almost like that stripping down. You know, it's, it's like going to boot camp. You get in there, your identity is taken. They break you down to the lowest form, and then they build you back up. And that was my start of getting into getting back to hoodoo because, like I said, I saw it, got exposed, but I didn't want to claim it because I didn't want people to think I was weird. I didn't want people to I didn't want that attention on me. But then once I said, you know what, screw it, let's do this. The immense breakdown that came for it from it and, and everything else and losing things, losing people, man, I. Lost cars, apartments, money. I, I can't tell you, I almost lost my life thinking that this will never end to where, okay, now let's build them back up. 
once I got to that point of getting built back up, okay, here's the information, here's the knowledge, go see this guy, go see this lady. And you go back to North Carolina, go talk to them, go talk to this person. And you know, sitting at the feet of the elders, because a lot of this, you can't learn in a book. So there are elders in hoodoo. There's yes. still people, there's a community, there's a structure to a certain degree by clans where you can actually go and learn this still. Yes. Yes. How do you feel people eliminating that process that you went through with elders is negatively affecting hoodoo as a whole? Because everything's coming to Google. You know, people feel like the elders can't teach me anything when in this age of information, I can just Google how to do a cow tongue work. And it shows me step by step how to do it. Yeah, but it doesn't show you where to put it at. It doesn't show you what to say. It doesn't correlate the Bible verse. It doesn't give you that you have to be up for a certain amount of time for this thing to manifest itself. It just shows you what to do. And so people want to have this microwave version of hoodoo. Oh, I could just put this in, do this, and bam, bam, bam. Now all of a sudden I have a title. I'm a priestess. I'm a priest. And no. That's not how this works. You have to sit at the feet of elders. You have to go to people. You have to humble yourself in front of these people who are teaching you. You know, there's times when I didn't even want to be there and they knew it, but I knew I had a job to do. I knew that my spiritual life was in jeopardy and nothing was going to change until I humbled myself at the feet of these people to say, hey, this is the issue that I'm going to. I need you. Re respecting the tradition, because um, I'm hearing you say there's a lot of self-made hoodoo kings and queens, you know, because <laughs> you've used that term, you know, you know, said person, you know, started out even under you, interacting with you, learning about your culture from you, and then all of a sudden, you know, they break away and now they're fully made, you know. Is there an actual initiation process? There is. Oh, wow. I, see, I didn't even know that. So there it's is. that structured. Wow. Yes, there is. Um, Zora Neale Hurston actually in one of her books described it. Their eyes were watching God. Uh, is that her? Yes, that is her. Well, I remember I read that book when I was in school. I loved it. it <laughs> yes, was fabulous. It, but there is a, uh, a a different book. I'm not even going to tell the book because then people are going to go and be like, "Oh, well, I'm gonna do this." And uh, yeah, no. but you have to have a you have to have two two elders there. It's either two or three. I'm sorry. I, yeah, it's been a while. I want to say three, three. It has to be three three elders. One at the head. One at the one at your midsection. One at your feet. Wow. And you have to lay a certain way with a certain amount of things for a certain amount of time. So there is a process a part that you have to you have to go through. There's no Google can't tell you this. Wikipedia can't tell you this. And a lot of elders have taken that secret to the grave because people have just totally wrote them off and said, well, I can just tick, 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 tick and put themselves, change their name on social media as who do priest or who do priestess, and that's it. And that 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 parallels Ifa because unfortunately, we always say this, the old guys took a lot with them, you know? And some of them did it on purpose because they're like, the people I'm around, they don't deserve it, yeah. you know? And I think that created a frustration that we have to get over because it's very easy to look at, you know, our parents or our elders and be like, man, you didn't give me this. We always have to kind of introspect and be like, what could I have done to be more deserving or to build that confidence and trust within them to allow me to inherit that? Because the problem with systems like this, whether it's Ifa, Huru, they're so beautiful. Yes. They're so pure and they're so effective. People died for this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? On either side. So I, I, I think that's where that comes from. And I think that's why it's so epic what you're doing of going through your process, following the proper apprenticeship and, and, and learning. Right. Yeah. To your knowledge, was Zora Neal was she initiated? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. Because when I when I read it, I was like, Ooh, uh, who authorized it? Yeah, right. <laughs> who, There's certain who, themes who, there. Who actually put this in a book? Yeah. You know, and you know, it, it 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 was a process. I mean, I didn't go through that process, yeah. but I went through a process that was very similar to it. Yeah. And like I said, one at the head, one at the middle section, one at the feet. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, okay. And luckily these were my relatives. Nice. That had me go through this. Yeah. So they had no. I mean, you're you're in the safest place possible. Mm -hmm. You know, people that want to see you succeed and and progress. I mean, other than Miss uh, Miss Herson, is there anybody else that's kind of public or popular right now that has kind of claimed like this is who I am? 
that you that you can recognize? I see remember? a lot of it. Um, like themes or yeah, subliminals? I see, a, uh, I see a lot with, um, uh, I want to say Kevin Gates has a song to where. I'm not surprised. He's yeah, a spiritual guy, yeah. To where he actually has the video of of the women putting spells on men. Oh yeah, um, I forgot that song. Yes. I, I'm a big fan of it. Yeah. Um, I, I see a lot of you know what I'm saying Rick Ross talking about. Yeah, yeah, I remember that lyric. You he know, threw it out. Uh, Trick Daddy also talking oh, about man. you know he's Gullah Geechee and you know. Um, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, I and but but if you listen to the older blues, the the Muddy Waters. Oh God. You know when Muddy Waters talks about my John the Conqueror root. Oh man! I was rubbing my root, my John the Conqueror. Is that a popular one? Yeah. Yes. You know, John the Conqueror, because a lot of people come into the Wotani guy and they're like, John the Conqueror, and you know, uh, the depiction of him is a guy that looks like King Arthur from Camelot. Mm -hmm. I've heard that that wasn't the case. So, if, could you clarify who, a little bit about who really John the Conqueror was? John the was? Conqueror was he was, <clears throat> according to the lore, according to the lore, he was a prince who was captured. He was either captured or sold into slavery. Well, because he had the gift of sight and he had the gift of knowledge, he was able to trick a lot of people. He was the he was the issue, the Alegua. Oh wow. Of his region. He had it. So when he got sold into slavery, his whole thing was tricking people, tricking the slave masters, tricking the people who tried to op oppress him to where he went missing and nobody knew about it to where he said, OK, I'm going to now that I'm here to help my people. And my people have been helped like they are. There's texts about him talking about the Civil War and predicting it 100 years out, saying, well, this will free us. This will give us some sort of freedom. And once he did that, he put himself into that route and disappeared. So, oh, wow, it was you, uh, a lot of the stories that I hear come from him being a slave. Um, a lot of them come from him not being the royal, but if you were to set up a altar to him or a shrine to him, you have to have his royal parts with him. Thank you so much for clarifying that because a lot of people come in and they're like, what is this thing? You know, and, and through education, we're able to, you know, provide the best to our clients. Um, you know, within hoodoo, is are there actually energies like that are similar to Odisha's, or is it more ancestors, or is it more these figures that have been able to help push this culture forward? What, what's three. the focus, really? So All there three. are deities. There are deities. Um, uh, uh, the man at the crossroads. Okay. You know the graveyard spirits. Okay. The spirits of the railroad. Um, then you get into the Orisha side of it when you talk about. Um, the man at the crossroads. That's basically his name, the man at the crossroads. Yeah, it's Eshu. Um, like yeah, Eshu is, 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 is depicted with that. Um, the graveyard spirits who basically watch, um, the watchers. Then you also get the uh, the crossroads, I mean the, uh, the railroad, when you get Railroad Bill, who was a trickster also, who was known to shapeshift. You get people like, um, oh, I can't think of his name, uh, it, it, it slips me right now, but he actually escaped slavery and went to a Native American shaman and said, never make me a slave again. So he made him an alligator with a human body that haunts the swamps, and he was fine with that. So you have those type of deities to where you can go into the swamps and talk to the talk to and leave an offering for that to where if you need that type of protection, that's who you go to. Wow. Now, can you get initiated into each of them, or do you just get initiated into Hudu and then you have a right to kind of interact with them? Uh, you these have energies? to get initiated or accepted, okay. per, per se. And that comes by family lineage into Hudu. Then that opens the door for anything. You know, there's people who I know who practice Hudu who have altars to Harriet Tubman because Harriet Tubman was known to have the gift of sight. She would also go, she would go into trance, they would say. Wow. before she would lead, lead the slaves away. Wow. So that way she would know the correct routes. That's why she never lost a slave. That's incredible. I didn't know that about Miss Tubman, you know, such an influential figure for her people and being able to free so many. Um, how, how involved were these guys with, you know, the, the Civil War process, the emancipation? Was it, I mean, are they the unsung heroes? Yes, 
Yes, to where even even once 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 Mama Tugman um, freed slaves, she was hired by the army as a scout, and she wow. would she would lead the troops into the South undetected. Wow, and they would wonder why in why in the world are the troops coming down here? How are they getting past all of our minefields and all of our Completely this? Completely unnoticed. Yeah, getting through all of these forts and all of these sets. Well, she would have to get to sight. She would go into trance and say, hey, this is the way to go. How, how important or how big was that relationship between them and their land? Because I tell you, you put me in the jungle, I'm, I'm dying of an infection or I'm not getting out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like there's nothing, there's nothing happening. But you look at these stories of these people, you know, obviously they brought so much acumen from Africa because you look at the, the foliage in Africa, you know, it trumps anything over here. Mm. You know, how important was it? knowing the land, interacting with the land, is, is Mother Earth really the focal point of yes. what you're doing? Yes, yes, it is. I mean, there was there were stories that I've heard, you know, you know, growing up as a kid to where I had family members, you could drop them off anywhere. Drop them off anywhere and give them 24 hours and they'd be back at the front door. Wow. Like, how? How was that possible? Because they knew the land. They knew that at a certain time the sun was in this quadrant. Okay, that's east. Oh, my God. You know, they could look at the stars and go, okay, you can do it at night. All right, cool. Bam, bam, bam. Right back at the front door. <laughs> so wow. it's it's important to always know the land. Always know where you are. Even if it's foreign, always know where you are. Always know where you have to go. Always know what, what's going to take you there. Wow. Other than Mr. Lomax, who you mentioned, who are some of those influences besides family that you've sought out or even within your family that you haven't mentioned now that have been oh, influences? Man. My mom. My mom was the biggest <laughs> proponent of this lifestyle to where, wow. like I said, it, it was one of the things that scared me. And I remember talking to my father one day and he was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm consecrating uh, some railroad spikes. He told me stories about, yeah, man, your mama used to have the railroad spikes in the full court. <sighs> he was like, did you did you spit rum on them? Oh my God, is dad from the same area? Or is from dad, the same dad, dad, dad is from Philadelphia. <laughs> oh man, he's, that's a whole. <laughs> yeah, he, he was just like, yeah, man, your mama used to do that, and you know, yeah, when I come, I would come in the house and see, you know, this going on, I'd be like. Mm. Okay, just go to the room and <laughs> lay down. He just kept it moving. Yeah, he you just know, kept it moving. Shout out to all those dads that just keep it moving. Because sometimes, <laughs> you know, the wife's doing something. You just, whatever you want to do, honey, you know what I'm saying? But ultimately, it was for the benefit of her family and ultimately mm -hmm. you. You know, I, I ask you, is there a certain garb or way to identify people like this? Because you're always so epic, you know, uh, so perfectly dressed. You know, I love the hat, by the way. Thank is you. this something um, significant? Because I see the feather. I see, you know, certain themes. Is is this? Is there a code or a dress code, or is it, you know, more like subtle? Uh, back in the day, yes. Um, toward now, the the hat is the throwback to the back in the day with the uh, the turkey feather. The turkey feather represents uh, the earth. It represents abundance. It represents protection. Yeah. So um, usually with hats like this, yeah, you, you actually want to wear a turkey feather or um, if you're what they call the gambling man, you want to have a playing card. Yeah. Um, matches were also things that kept that they kept tucked in the hat. So the hat was very important in hoodoo culture. Um, but it's more of the traditions of what you're doing, like the you way know, they would carry themselves. Like the way I would they would carry themselves. Like say for instance, uh, if we're at the club and I give you a bottle, what's the first thing you do? People smack the bottle. Oh, that's where the tapping of that's the henny the comes tapping. from? Yes. That's I didn't know that. Wow. Comes from. Because alcohol is considered spirits and you want to wake the spirits up. Oh, wow. So that way, what you're consuming is actually having a positive effect. Yes. So there's certain things like that to where, you know, you won't necessarily, you know, un un unless a person has on, you know what I'm saying, their, their, their copper, which is, you know, then the, the, the protector, um, or their, have on their uh mojo bag which you know they have it in their pocket or some of them wear it around their neck or they have a dime uh on a string around their neck or on their left uh ankle you you really wouldn't know nice so it's a way to identify what is the most frustrating thing um well, let me even before i ask that question what are the negative ramifications that can come from delving into this spirituality 
without going through the proper processes and, you know, ha without, you know, mentioning people per se, what cases have you seen of those effects when they haven't done things correctly? People getting themselves in way too deep, thinking that they're, thinking that they're up here when they're not. You know, I've seen people wind up in the hospital. I've seen people lose jobs. I've seen people have nervous breakdowns because they went on Google and Google said, Somebody on TikTok said, somebody on Facebook said, somebody on social media said, oh, well, if you light this candle and do this, you know, all your problems will go away. You'll have money. You'll have this. You'll have that. I, I've, I've seen it all. And especially with the age of social media, with the age of nobody coming and saying, hey, I need to humble myself. Can you teach me? Can you show me? Can you help me? Everybody wants to be, oh, well, you know. A figure. Yeah, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. I don't care to be. That's that's not in my nature. But if you if you come to me with a with a problem that I haven't seen before, I'm going to ask you, hey, let me research this right quick. Don't microwave this answer because I need to tell you the correct and proper way of getting yourself out of this instead of saying, well, you need to talk to your ancestors, because sometimes that's not the case. There are some ancestors who don't even want you to reference them. You know, but people, that's that's their and, and that's a telltale sign for me. When someone says, oh, you need to talk to your, your ancestors about it, that you're telling me that that person has no clue what they're doing. If they're telling you to talk to your ancestors or or they say, well, the ancestors have a, a a message for you. Your ancestors can't tell me anything for me. They can't. My ancestors won't go to you and say, tell Rafiq this. Yeah. Because I'm in the stage of where they can tell me. They're going to tell Rafiq. <laughs> They're going to tell you know, me. You have that relationship and you've sacrificed and put in that time to developing that bond with them even after, you know, they've transitioned, mm -hmm. you know. What is some of the most positive things you've seen by way of the spirituality, experiences, testimonials, effective, effectivity? Peace. I've seen peace that I have chased for years and all because... And, and, and it was the simplest thing, all because I left my grandmother some coffee one day. Nice. And I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. This is beautiful. This is amazing. This is what I've been wanting. And once I started doing that, I said, well, what's more, what can I do more? If I'm getting this piece for a couple of days, I need to be able to do more to where I need to keep this piece. So that's been, that's been one of the most beautiful things that I've, that I've seen has just been to affect me of, you know, hearing that voice of, hey, man, don't turn down the street, go up a couple blocks and then yeah. get home. You watch the news. Oh, it was an accident, you know, or, you know, I don't get a, I don't get upset when I leave my place and then I get all the way downstairs and, oh, I forgot my wallet. And I got to go back upstairs Yeah, because then I have to get on I-4, the turnpike or whatever. And there's an accident that I could have been in. So there's things like that 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 those little things that happen, I learned to accept it and go, cool, it's you're, beautiful. You're living in line with your spirit, you're living in line with nature, and that's what Africa is all about, going with that flow. And going with the flow is not being complacent. It's mm -hmm. as you grow and as you mature, you, you reach a level of acceptance, and acceptance is not failure. Acceptance is natural to a certain degree, and, and that's why nature worship is what the whole basis of all this is. Um, you know, what would you say to somebody who is interested in hoodoo? What, what, what's the best advice? Somebody that's initiated like yourself, coming from such a lineage and a clan, what, what would you, you know, tell them? Research. First thing you got to do is research. Um, actually, I take that back. The first thing that you have to do is have a, a I take that, yeah, you have to have a, an appreciation for yourself first. You have to love yourself, trust yourself. Know that yourself is not going to lead you down any road that is not for you. Once you do that, then you can start the research part of finding out what relatives, if any, were involved in this. Then you can proceed forward with the altar. Then you can proceed forward with honoring. You know, people jump straight to, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm going to just build a, you know what I'm saying, altar. Yeah, they and come in here sometime with lists and things like that. And, you know, me not having the knowledge that I have now after speaking with you, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that that streamlined version isn't the way to go. No, you know? it's not. It's it's not. I mean, I I didn't have an altar for years. 
You were because, preparing yourself. Yeah, for because it. I was like, it's it's not my time to have an altar. And then when I did have an altar, there's six ancestors who wanted to be on it. Wow. So imagine having to do six different things. Yeah. Because no one wants the same thing. You know, it's not all about, oh yeah, everybody gets liquor. Some of them don't want liquor. Yeah. Some want some tea. Some wants tea. Coffee. Some wants like coffee. Grandma. Yeah. Some wants this. Some wants that. You know, even even with food, you have to realize what did what did my ancestors eat when they were here? You know, they weren't vegan. I can't no, no. I can't put vegan food on it. They didn't they, have the luxury. Yeah, they they weren't vegan. Now, if you give me some ribs, <laughs> some shrimp and grits. Yeah, some shrimp and grits. I might I mean, be able to I, do I, something. I, I could put that up there for them because that's who they were. That's what they ate. You know, even even my grandmother loved a soup that had a chicken foot in it. You know how hard it is to find chicken foot soup in Florida? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially because we're not making it how she made it. Exactly. So we got to so, try to find a way. So I have to do this whole thing of, okay, what did I have? What did she have in this thing? Okay, I had to do this, this, this. this. You got to put it up there. I ain't going to eat it. <laughs> no, that's all for her. <laughs> that's all for her. So so those, those, those are the things that anybody that wants to get into this, the first thing you have to do is re, is is love yourself respect yourself, then that's when you start going to, you know what I'm saying, altars. Don't just jump into altars thinking that everything's going to be fine. Rafiq, what, if you had a convers- if you had the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with all these wonderful people you've mentioned, Gullah Jack, Mama Tubbin, you know, uh, the, the other gentlemen that helped Gullah Jack, all these people, what would you say to them? Thank you. Thank you. Because... If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here. If it weren't for you, or my state of bondage would be different. If it weren't for you, the people who I honor, who I respect, I can't do the things that I do. So I would, I would thank them whole. I mean, I would be on my knees crying. Thank you, because they gave the ultimate sacrifice for me to be able to walk around with, you know, the hat on. To me, to be able to walk around with my uh, juju bag on me to me to be able to walk around with my, you know, my, my, my sandalwood mala. They gave that sacrifice to where when they were alive, that was frowned upon. That was death instantly. So I would say, thank you. I would thank them from the bottom of my heart and hope that what I'm doing for them is continuing their legacy. That's beautiful brother. And I, I really appreciate you sitting down with us because from what I've been able to see, and even more so now with you, it's a beautiful tradition, one that deserves respect, one that has a process, and one that is to be taken seriously, yes. right? So um, from all of us here, thank you once again. I, I doubt it'll be the last time you're on here. I'll be back. <laughs> and thank you so much. All <laughs> thank right? you. All right, perfect. Family, a couple thoughts before we go ahead and disconnect. First and foremost, you're going to find uh, Mr. Rafiq, Mr. Rafiq's or Gullah Feek's, um, you know, contact information in uh, the description if you want to get closer to him and be able to progress more within Hoodoo through the proper channels. Um, Botanica Candles and More is up and running with consultations, mentorship programs, and shipment of products. Um, membership is coming soon, right, for you trying to get exclusive content or access to us to be able to go over all of your questions or your growth with any fan or Risha. The podcast, by the way, is on all major platforms, right? Be sure to like this video, comment on this video, share it, and subscribe. A big thank you from everyone here at Our Roots Podcast. And until next time, guys, see the light. See the light.